The scary stories will start in 45 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you to subscribe if you enjoy my videos. Quality is most important to me when it comes to making my videos, but there's another thing that I think sets me apart from other narrators here on YouTube, and it's my minimal ad promise. This video is a little over two hours long, and there is and always will be only three mid-roll ads. Three ads. That's a promise. I will never get greedy, and I want you to enjoy my videos without being interrupted over and over again. It ruins the mood, and I know that. So again, if you enjoy this video, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It really does help me more than you know. Now, let's begin. When I was 14, I was sent to a mental institution. Here's why. I don't have any friends, and I kept to myself. I loved to look at pictures of dead people. And to be honest, I still do. My parents struggled with trying to make me act normal. And I have no explanation for you or for them. I didn't like other kids. I didn't like anyone. Not even my parents. The only person that I did like was my little brother Harold, who was just like me. He was quiet and he didn't have any friends either. We would play outside and hang out all the time, and everything was great. Until this one night. Harold and I got into an argument, and he told me that he wished he could kill our parents. I wasn't close with our parents, and like I said before, I didn't even like them but I never felt like hurting them. Harold told me that not only did he want to hurt them, he wanted to cut them open with the pocket knife in the garage. He wanted to take the knife and slit them open. This made me cry. I ran to my parents' room, probably like 2 o'clock in the morning, screaming and crying. Harold followed me and was screaming that I was lying over and over. I screamed and told my parents what Harold said and what he wanted to do. My mom started crying uncontrollably, and my dad started breathing really heavy. Obviously, what I told them was scaring them, and Harold was crying too at this point. The next day, my dad took me to the mental institution. For the longest time, I was in that hospital, angry, not understanding why I had to live there and Harold didn't. It wasn't until seven years later that I learned why. My dad came to visit me one day, and when I asked about Harold, as I always did, he finally said it. Harold didn't exist. I ran into their room that night, screaming and arguing with myself about how I wanted to kill them. But I didn't want to. This was out of this world, insanely scary. Please forgive the short length. Not much happened. I was 11 years old living in Boston with my dad. I woke up one night super late for an unknown reason. You know how sometimes you just wake up, look around your room and then fall back asleep? Yep, that's what happened. I woke up not sure what time, but sometime in the middle of the night. I was looking around the room and sitting in the darkness of my open closet, I saw a face. A face I had never seen before. Someone was sitting in my closet looking at me. The ability to move my limbs completely left me. I was frozen. I stared at this person for what felt like an hour. Trying to remember now, I'd say it was really only about 20 seconds. Whoever it was reached their arm out of the darkness in front of them, and slid the closet door closed, looking into my eyes the entire time. The door closed, and I lay there frozen for probably another 20 seconds, and then I realized I had to leave this room. Obviously, there was no way I was going to go back to sleep. I got up as silently as I could and walked out of my bedroom, which the door was cracked open. I ran to my dad's room and went inside. I woke him up, and naturally, he was shocked, 
when I told him that someone was in my closet. He told me to stay in his room and he went to check. The thought of something happening to my dad scared the hell out of me, so I was crying, waiting for him to come back. After a minute or two, he finally came back and told me that no one was there. Cliché ending, I know. I will say this, I do not care if people believe me or not. It really happened. I was not dreaming. When I left my room, whoever it was in the closet left as well. The front door, the back door, and most of our windows were all unlocked. Stupid, I know, but we were ignorant. This happened six years ago, and when I try to remember the face, I can't visualize the details except one thing. One thing I have always been sure of. It was a man, and he was missing teeth. How do I know? Because he was smiling at me the whole time. I'm a 17-year-old guy currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. This incident took place around six months ago on an overnight trip into the Superstition Mountains, which are about an hour drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you say too much. Whether it's a good trail, abandoned mine, ghosts or whatever it might be, people come flocking and usually with a lot of trash and loud music. This particular trail I was taking was an 8 mile loop through a canyon, a pretty simple overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend, but at last minute he cancelled and he left me on my own. So with a packed bag and a car ready to go, I decided to go on my own. Not leaving the house on time and some trouble navigating rough forest roads, I didn't arrive to the trailhead until around 5.45, which for those of you who don't backpack, this is a very big no-no. I had about a four mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot, and it was getting dark fast. So I figured if I moved quick enough, I could get at least two to three miles in before I had to find a spot. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Hiking in the dark by itself is scary, especially for where I was and being on my own. Eventually it got so dark that I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and get a camp set up. With only using the headlamp as my light source and trying to move fast, I ended up in a less than ideal spot, but there were some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle, so it looked like people had been there before, but it didn't look recent. My first priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area around me and was able to find some dry wood, and I got the fire going. I got my tarp set up and cracked an open can of chili mac I had brought for myself and was very much looking forward to eating. I was feeling good. My camp was set up and my food was on the fire. The feeling of uneasiness from the hike had almost gone away, but it was still there. The side effect of camping alone in a remote area. To fully understand what happened, I have to explain to you how my camp was set up. The site I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees, with the trail about 30 feet to my left. When you're in the woods and have a fire going, the fire casts a circle of light around it, and everything in the edge of that circle, and past it, are pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire eating my dinner, when a small rock, about the size of a marble, was thrown into my camp. I looked in shock as I was positive that I was the only person on this trail that night. I immediately turned my light on and towards the area where I had seen the rock come from, but due to the density of the pines and the brush, I could only see about 10 feet. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I scanned in the tree line that surrounded me, searching for whoever had thrown the rock, not daring to stray too far from my fire, that in hindsight, offered me a false sense of security. After sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I was able to convince myself that I had somehow kicked the rock, 
or it had fallen from a tree or something. I went to sleep that night not expecting the pure terror that was about to unfold. I awoke to the sound of rustling leaves, barely inaudible if you weren't listening for them, but they were there. Still in a sleepy daze, I listened as the rustling of leaves got harder to hear as I assumed they were moving away from me. I went to grab my handheld flashlight that I had left next to me when I had fallen asleep, but the more I looked, the more scared I got as I came to realize that it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag and ducked out of my tarp and looked around. I was able to see a light off in the woods. It couldn't have been more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight, laying on the ground in a pile of leaves. This is one of those few moments in my life where I've almost crapped my pants. The flashlight that I had left sitting right next to me when I had fallen asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away, in the tree line of the woods. I hurriedly slipped my boots on clutching my knife in my other hand and keeping my head on a swivel. I weighed my options. Stay here and wait out the night or attempt the three mile hike back to the car in the dark. I figured that whoever was out there with me was definitely going to have a better advantage if I was out on the trail without a light. So I decided to stay at the camp and wait out the night. Eventually, whoever it was came back. I could hear them walking around the woods. It was far off, but I could hear them. It sounded like someone leisurely walking by, like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes they would walk so far away and I would lose the sound of their steps. But then, an hour later, maybe two, they would return, still faint. This went on for three or four hours until I listened to the steps get closer and closer, until they were about seven feet away from me. At this point, the fire had gotten very small, as I had run out of wood in my pile. The footsteps stopped, and everything went totally silent. I sat there still, for two hours, clutching a knife in my hand, and prayed that I wouldn't hear anything else. I stayed like that until the sun cast enough light that I could see that I was alone in my campsite. I packed my things and speed walked the three miles back down the trail I had taken. I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked and nearly sprinted to it as I unlocked my Subaru, jumped in, and drove, and didn't stop until I had put at least 20 miles between me and that place. I stopped at a gas station to buy a Red Bull, but mostly just to see or talk to another person. As I exited the store, I was able to read what someone had written in the dust on my back window. Sleep well? A lot of weird things have happened to me on my various adventures through Arizona, but this is the weirdest and the scariest by far. There was somebody seriously deranged in the woods that night. Do yourself a favor and stay as far away from those mountains as you can. My girl and I frequent the drive-in theater all the time in the summer. It's May, and I don't think we'll be doing it this year because of what happened last year. I'm not sure if it's different anywhere else, but at the drive-ins closest to us, there's two movies that play on a single screen, back to back. It's also pretty cheap, so it's an awesome choice for a hot summer night. We were doing our normal thing. We went to the store to get some candy and beer before heading to the drive-ins. I'm sure you know that the food at any theater is ridiculously expensive, so we saved some money by doing that. We made it there about 30 minutes before the first movie started, and people were still showing up. We got the front row, with nobody in front of us, which somehow I always managed to get. After 30 minutes of waiting and munching on junk food, the preview started for the first movie. Everything was completely normal up until this point, and during the previews I heard a loud noise. It sounded like someone had kicked a rock at my truck. Not a lot, it just sounded like a good-sized rock hit my tailgate or something. We thought nothing of it because our focus was on the screen. 
An hour or so went by with no other unusual sounds, and we were enjoying the movie, when suddenly we both heard something strange. It sounded like somebody was walking right next to the truck and dragging their feet. We looked around but saw nothing. I was looking around, and I spotted a girl in the passenger seat of the car next to us, and she was looking at me. She had a concerned look on her face, and she motioned for me to roll my window down. I did, and she immediately said, There is someone under your truck. This made me feel sick. I knew she wasn't messing with me, and didn't know what to say back or what to do. My girl started to quietly freak out, and I asked the girl next to us as quietly as I could what the person was doing. She said back, I don't know. I was afraid to get out, and I remembered that eerie feeling that I had when I was a kid, and I didn't want to step off my bed at night for fear of someone underneath. Same feeling. I decided to call the drive-in's number listed online and told them what was happening. After asking the details of my truck, they said they would send somebody over to us. Before anyone came, we very suddenly heard more noise under the truck, and then a girl wearing a dress crawled out from under my truck, right in front of us, and began walking backwards toward the movie screen. When she got to the screen, she turned and walked away towards the fence that separated our lot and the one next to us. A few minutes later, a man approached my window, and I told him that the girl had walked away. One of the worst nights of my life was December 28th, 2013. To put it bluntly, and in as few words as possible, a tough Christmas had been rough on my mental health. Then a straight-up shouting match with my mom just kind of finished me off. I stormed out of our family home, screaming profanity and swearing that they would never see me again. Yep, I was that petulant teenager. Sure, I had forgotten my phone and wallet, but was I way too proud to go back and get them? You bet. So in my fit of only partially warranted rage, I somehow decided it would be a good idea to try to hitchhike to my friend's house so I could stay the night there. I had never hitchhiked before. Hell, I don't think I'd even held my thumb out for a cab at that point in my life. But there I was, stood on a stretch of Florida highway, trying to catch the attention of a passing driver. To my surprise, someone actually pulled over pretty quickly, and not the hippie bus rust bucket I had been visualizing either. It was one of those high-end Chevys. I'm not sure which model, and the guy behind the wheel actually looked like that he had a few dollars. I mean, he was the typical-looking rich dad type. Absolutely nothing to indicate that he was anything but nice and well-meaning. Hop in, he calls out from the open passenger window. I couldn't believe my luck, like not only was I about to actually hitchhike for the first time, which felt pretty cool, not gonna lie, but I was able to do so in style. I can't tell the difference between faux leather and the real deal, but when you're in an air-conditioned sedan that still has the new car smell at 17, who cares? I felt grown up as hell. So the guy asks me why I'm hitchhiking, and I'll be honest. I may have given him a totally hopped up version of events, which totally made me out to be the victim. Abusive parents, poor me, blah blah blah. Naturally, he takes this as gospel and starts telling me how his father was an alcoholic, how he sympathized with my situation. I asked him to take me as far down the road as he could, and that I had a friend that lived about 30 minutes drive away. He said cool, and down the highway we go. As he's driving, we talk a lot more about family. He pops the glove box and boom, there's a picture of his kids. As I'm looking at his little girls, he starts telling me how important he thinks family is, especially to those of us that come from less than stable backgrounds. Then he said something that seemed completely out of character. We're pulling into a gas station after mentioning that he needs to fill up, continuing the family conversation in segments, if that makes any sense. One minute he'll stop talking because he needs to focus on a turn or a lane switch, and then he carries on. 
So it was almost out of nowhere when he said something like, We have to protect our families from our true natures. I didn't know what to say to that, not in that moment. So I just kind of stayed quiet as he gets out of the car and starts filling up the tank. I had a few minutes to process those words, and the more I thought about them, the more I realized that hitchhiking may not have been such a good idea. When he gets back in after paying for the gas, there's a few moments of quiet as I'm still trying to work out just what he meant by his last statement. So I just asked. I straight up asked him what he meant by something so ominous. It'll be easier if I show you. Ever wonder what it would feel like to tuck and roll out of a moving vehicle? Ever tried to imagine it because you're literally about to do it and you're pretty sure it'll kill you at the speeds you're traveling? Probably not. I hadn't. Not until that moment right there. But somehow I convinced myself that I was just being overly dramatic. Too little too late. So I just stayed in the car. I didn't even ask for him to pull over or anything. Looking back on it, I wasn't sure what was going through my head at all. Just that I really, really didn't want to be around this guy anymore. He had gone from nice and normal to moody and creepy in light speed. You know, everyone has secrets, he says after pulling into a dark commercial lot and shutting off the engine. So, imagine that line spoken as creepily as you can imagine and then double it. And that's what this guy sounded like. I had kept my tone polite up until that point. I needed this guy to get me to my friend's house. But I was all out of cool by then. And I'm literally about to ask him what the hell he's talking about when he puts his hand on my thigh. He doesn't just put it there either. He puts it there and starts squeezing. Like I said before, he had pictures of his kids, mentioned his wife. He even bitched about his in-laws a little bit during our little family talk. Look, what I'm trying to say is he did what he did because he was a predator. I'm sure of it. He saw someone vulnerable who apparently had a rough childhood or family background and saw someone he could manipulate. It was the look in his eyes. Man, not this vulnerable I like you look. It was like a hunger. That's the only way I can describe it like an excitement before a feast. I just hit him. I'm not some tough guy. I don't do MMA. Hell, I don't even think I landed the punch properly, but I threw it hard enough to let him know that he was not about to molest me in a dark parking lot in the middle of winter. Then, I tried to undo my seatbelt. Tried being the operative word. I pushed the little red button and absolutely nothing happened. No clicking or catching of mechanisms. Nothing. You should have seen this guy smile when that happened. I will never ever forget that look in his eye. Pure predator. I'm not even ashamed to admit that I started screaming for help, like a little kid. But ever have a nightmare where you try to scream, but your voice keeps catching in your throat? It's so scary because it can literally happen. And it happened to me right there in that dark parking lot. I'm not even entirely sure what happened next. I remember slamming my fist into the glass window and it shattering all over me. I know I must have gotten the door open somehow too. There were headlights behind us. Someone was shouting as they intervened. The predatory driver reached under his seat and I thought for a moment that he was about to pull out a gun or something. But then, the seatbelt felt just loose. I just rolled out of the car as it sped away. In retrospect, I think the guy had a way to unbuckle it like he jury-rigged it under his seat, if that makes any sense. I mean, it was tight as hell, and then, it just wasn't. And then the cops are there. My rescuer must have called, and I'm just numb. Not only because I couldn't believe I had almost gotten myself kidnapped or whatever. I mean, I have no idea what that guy was planning for me. Other than it wasn't good. Or innocent. But it was the fact that my own foolish pride. My own self-pity and lies. Could have been the things really responsible for what could have easily been an untimely death.
When I was 15 years old, my great uncle passed away due to a sudden heart attack. My father and I had to clean out his house. My great uncle was very much loved by all of us and really was one of the nicest and most loving people around. My father was just as broken up about losing him as everyone else was in my family, but the job had to be done. So we arrived at his house early in the morning one day. His house was very neat and well organized, so we would be done in a day or two tops. I remember as a kid we would always play over at his house when my dad had to work. He would let us play anywhere in the house, except the attic. He made it very clear to us going up and down the ladder to the attic was dangerous. Therefore, we never were allowed up there, and we never thought anything of it. Even though he would go up there sometimes for about 30 minutes, and then he would come back down, never actually bringing anything down with him or taking anything up there. While we were cleaning, I decided to finally go up to the attic just to see if there was anything there. It was completely empty up there besides two boxes that were tucked away in a corner. Thinking nothing of it as I picked up the dusty boxes and took them downstairs. Once I got to the living room, I opened them expecting to see some papers because the boxes were so light. Instead, I found all these pictures. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of pictures of what I could tell were pictures of different women. All from angles where you could clearly tell they didn't know they were being photographed. He had pictures from daytime to night and from multiple locations. In some pictures they were undressed, and in others they were just doing everyday things like cooking and cleaning. With every picture I looked through, my heart started to beat faster and faster. Looking closer, I realized one of the women was his wife who had passed away several years earlier. I looked on the back of the pictures and they were all named. I didn't want to freak my family out without knowing exactly what I was looking at, so out of curiosity, I googled some of the names and found one of the ladies on Facebook. I was so glad to see that the woman was alive and well. Once finding that out, I showed the pictures to my dad, and he was just as shocked as I was. He took the boxes, and I never saw them again, and we never spoke of it again. Still, every once in a while I find myself wondering why he had those pictures, and if he took them himself, or had someone else take them. I loved my great uncle very much, and couldn't imagine him being anything less than a stand-up guy. I don't know what to think. Imagine finding something like that from someone that you've loved. It freaked me out really bad. This happened to me when I was about 10 years old. I'm 31 now. Bear with me as some of the details are a little hazy. I was spending the weekend at my best friend Ben's house. Friday and Saturday, Ben's parents were going to be out late. Ben's older sister lives in the garage that was converted into his studio, which meant that Ben and I would have the whole house to ourselves. Friday after school, Ben's father picked us up and we went to the video store to rent some horror movies, and then to 7-Eleven to get junk food for our night. We had just finished watching Scream 2, and were about to watch The Wishmaster, when Ben turned to me and said, let's do something else. I remember it raining that night, and Ben's parents telling us not to play out front, to stay in the backyard. That's exactly what we did. Ben and I loved to play hide-and-seek in his backyard, since it was like a maze back there with low-hanging lemon trees and a couple of paved walkways leading to the garage and leading to the back shed where Ben kept his pet iguana. Rock, paper, scissors, and Ben was the seeker as I went to go hide. Ben would count by the back door and then would start seeking after counting to 50. Then, if I could make it back to the back door, which we called home free, then Ben would lose that round. Ben started to count, and I ran through the pouring rain to the back of the shed, where I knew he wouldn't find me. I heard him yell, ready or not, here I come. I kneeled down as much as I could, listening for him to get near, so I could run to the porch and be home free. A few minutes later, I heard him walking through leaves on the other side of the shed. 
I knew he couldn't see me. It was too dark. He got really close and then stopped. I thought to myself, what is he doing? And then I heard some kind of bag rustling. I almost stood up when I heard Ben shout. Hey, I give up. It's too rainy out here. Let's go back in. His voice sounded like he was back on the porch. Then who was standing right next to me? Without hesitation, I darted out as fast as I could to the back porch and told Ben to hurry inside. We ran inside and I locked the door and told Ben, There's someone out there by your shed. After some convincing, he finally believed me. We obviously did not go back out there. His parents got home later that night. We told them what happened. There wasn't much they could do, and I know they didn't call the police, but Ben's dad went out back and locked up the fence. We were told not to play by that shed anymore, and definitely not past sunset. The next morning we got up late and went to the kitchen to eat. Ben walked towards the back door and motioned for me to go over there. I walked over and we both stared at muddy footprints leading to the back door. We always talked about what happened that night, both of us always wondering, who was back there? What was he doing and where did he go? And most of all, what would he have done if he had gotten his hands on us? Years ago, when I was eight years old, my family lived in this big, weird house, kind of on the edge of a small town. The school district was in the middle of a big restructuring, so even though we were only a couple grades apart, my brother and I went to different schools and took different buses. This left me as the last person to leave in the morning and the first person to get home in the afternoon, which meant it was my job to make sure all the lights were off in the morning and that the door was locked. One morning I noticed the basement door was open and the light was on, so before I left, I turned the light off and closed the door. When I got home that afternoon, the light was back on and the door was wide open. I just assumed that I had forgotten to actually take care of it when I noticed it in the morning, so I went over to turn the light off again and closed the door. When I got to the top of the basement stairs, I looked down and there was a man standing at the bottom looking up at me. I slammed the door and pushed a bunch of boxes against it and then went and hid in my closet. It was one of the most terrifying moments of my life. This story happened to my best friend and I when we were 16 on Halloween night. It happened at my parents' house which they still live in. Their house is in a very nice neighborhood, and it has a driveway that stretches very long, about a quarter mile down the street. My parents were gone on this particular Halloween, and my buddy and I were just watching scary movies. My parents had bought several huge bags of candy for the kids who would come by trick-or-treating. There were a lot of other houses on the street, and they knew of a lot of kids that would be coming. The night was passing. We were watching movies, and we realized at about 9.30 that not a single trick-or-treater had come to the house yet. We thought that this was strange, and went out onto the front porch to see if we could spot any trick-or-treaters. The street was far off, and I couldn't see anybody. We decided to walk up the driveway and look down the street to see if there were any kids coming. We began walking and kicking rocks. About halfway up the driveway, we spotted something. There was someone sitting in the driveway, at the start of it, right next to the street. He was sitting in a chair. We stopped walking and looked at this person. We were pretty sure that they were facing the street, away from us. The person appeared to be a man, with long brown hair. We started tripping out, because why in the hell would somebody be sitting in the chair in the driveway? At first we planned on going back to the house as this was creepy as hell. But curiosity grew too much, and we decided to approach the man. We started slowly walking again, and walked even slower the closer that we got. 
We eventually reached the man sitting in a chair. My buddy and I looked at each other, as if to figure out who was going to say something. I turned back to the man and said, Uh, hello? The man turned his head to the left very fast and yelled, If you come any closer, I will kill you. He then got up and started moving towards us, but we had bolted as soon as he yelled those words. Rocks were being kicked up as we sprinted back to the front porch, and when we reached the front door, I looked down the driveway before we slammed the front door closed, and for the briefest of seconds, I saw the man was now standing up, and he was halfway down the driveway, looking towards us. We locked the deadbolt and chain. I ran over to the kitchen phone and dialed my father. It took my parents about an hour to get home from the party they were at, and my buddy and I were scared as hell the whole time. We locked every window, and we were hiding in my dad's office until they arrived. To our surprise, they came into the house with a cop. Apparently, the man sitting in the chair was a disgruntled employee that my father had just let go earlier that day, and he was waiting for him to come home. What was he planning on doing? Who knows? No wonder we didn't see any trick-or-treaters on Halloween that night. They were scared off by this psycho sitting in a chair. Sometimes the things we say to others can come back to haunt us. Even when it's someone we think that we know well, words and intent can become twisted, especially over the internet. This next story should serve as a strong reminder to be careful of what you may say to others. Although you might mean them no harm, not everyone can take a joke. At the end of 2012, I stumbled upon a male-centered chat room by one of those men's fashion-style magazines. I lurked for a week or two before I decided to officially join discussions. The topics that were thrown around were what you would imagine a bunch of 18 to 45 year old guys would talk about. Women, beer, guns, video games, the usual things. Another very common thing that you will see if you spend any time around men is harmless banter. The old yo mama jokes and the type. On occasion, the mean spirited fellow will come along and take things too far. But normally, most lines are rarely crossed. That being said, almost every one of us men have said something that offended another without meaning to. While speaking face to face, your meaning can occasionally be misconstrued. But online, the chances of this happening can increase greatly. And thinking of what you are about to say is very important. On one occasion, I said something that I didn't feel was that bad, but every day since then, I have wished that I could take it back. I believe I had been a member of the chat for over a year by then. The room was a relatively active one, and I was one of the most active. I had traded friendly barbs back and forth with others so many occasions, and nothing ever became of it. One morning over coffee, I was BSing with a group of three or four other members. All but one guy were long-timers. The fourth guy had been around for less than a month. This didn't matter to us, though. Regardless of how long you've been around, we welcomed everyone with open arms. If I recollect right, the new guy had made a joking comment about his wife, and others of us did the same. Up to then, all was well with the group. But then I made my own joke about the new guy's wife and all hell broke loose. To show how little I thought about it at the time, I can't even remember what the joke was about. If I was to guess, it was probably about her weight. If that was the subject, in hindsight, it was likely the wrong thing to mention, but in my defense, I had heard much worse things exchanged there, and no one ever batted an eye. What was said doesn't matter. If it offended the man, then I was out of line, and I take full responsibility for my actions. That morning was a slightly different matter. Even after the guy told me I had gone too far, I disregarded his words and told him to chill out and stop being a wuss. 
I probably couldn't have said anything worse. The rest of the guys quietly left, and he and I were the only two remaining. No reply came from his end for a long time, and I was just about to log off when he began typing. He demanded that I apologize that second, or he was going to beat an apology out of me. Naturally, this made me chuckle, and I replied by saying, What are you going to do, reach through my computer screen? I still hate myself for being such an a-hole. I don't have to. I know exactly where you live, and to make sure you're paying attention, I know your kids' names, and what school they go to. Now, I was beginning to get angry myself. Threatening my children was way overboard. This made my response to him cruder than usual. I confidently called his bluff. To my surprise, he wasn't bluffing. He would follow up by typing out my full address, including my children's full names, birth dates, and schools. He wanted my full attention, and he most certainly got it. I have never been so terrified in my life. Just to drive his point home, he added by telling me that he lived in the next town over. Even if he was lying about that, I wasn't going to risk it. My reply to him was perhaps the most thought-out apology I had ever given someone, and be sure, I meant each and every word. He made me wait several minutes before he answered. I was beginning to pull my hair out. The relief I felt after reading it was indescribable. Okay, I accept your apology. Let this be a lesson to you. You never know who you're talking to, and what they may know or are willing to do to get back at you. By this point, I was so spent from the shock of the last half hour, I could only answer with thank you. I could only hope he meant what he said, and that my family was safe. In the end, my apology would have never been made if I was the only person in danger. He could come over and do his best at kicking my ass, but the second my family became a target, no matter how mad it made me, I had no other option. You have to believe any man angry enough to threaten another man's kids is crazy enough to carry them out. That's never a thing that should be wagered on. We now move on to this last year. My family and I were at the local Irish festival, having a great time. My run-in with the guy from the chat room had faded far from my mind. My daughters were at a booth getting their faces painted, and I was sitting nearby taking a break with my beer. My wife was waiting in line for some food. I was sitting alone, taking in the wonderful smells and sounds filling the air. Out of nowhere... A uniformed cop drops down next to me on the bench and says hello. I thought nothing of it and said hello back. Brent wanted me to let you know that he may have forgiven you, but he hasn't forgotten. He pointed you out to me and asked that I pass on this message. We police take good care of each other, you see. Have a fun day. The cop stood up and quietly walked away. I was completely dumbstruck. Not a word could form in my mind. I helplessly scanned the crowd, looking for what? I did not know. My daughters and wife carried on, clueless as to what had just occurred. I spent the remainder of the day constantly looking over my shoulder while trying to hide my fear from them. A day has not gone by since that I haven't been on guard. This year's festival is soon approaching and my daughters are highly anticipating it. My instincts tell me not to go, but doing that would only draw questions that I am not ready to answer. More than likely, I'll be spending the weekend there, searching the faces of every strange man and police officer, wondering if my family is safe to enjoy themselves. I can only pray that his anger has cooled over time, and that last year's talk was nothing more than a gentle reminder to be kinder to my fellow man.
This happened when I was in my early teens, in the late 80s. My family lived in a very secluded, forested area. We had a long driveway, and our small home sat on a square acre of mowed grass with woods on two sides. I was alone late one night, talking with my buddy from school. I often rode my bike to town over the summer, and he invited me to come over and spend the night. It was a 20-mile trip over completely empty country roads, but it was always an adventure, and I seldomly hesitated to go when I had a place to stay. I told him it was a sure thing. I'd call my mom at work and then start my ride. Here's where it gets creepy. Once I hung up the phone and started getting dressed, all black, I picked up the phone again to call my mom. The line was dead. This had never happened before. It was a sturdy rotary phone, and we never had problems with it. My thought instantly went to the small phone box at the back of the house. It was tiny, round junction with nothing but a rubber covering. Behind the cover was the exposed connection between the phone pole and our inside line. The wires were twisted together and capped but completely vulnerable. I questioned why I would even think about that. Why would I jump to conclusions about the cause of the deadline? I was overwhelmed with a sense of dread that didn't make sense, and I was wrestling with my feelings. I decided to behave as though I was in real danger, but calm myself by focusing on how unlikely it was, and how my imagination was probably getting the best of me. But I couldn't shake that feeling that I was in trouble. I finished dressing and strapped a buck knife to my hip. The old Rambo knives with the compass in the stock. It was cheap, but very big. I moved quietly and planned how I would leave the house. I remember this very well. I would slide out of the front door and pull it closed behind me, locked. I would not be able to get back in. I would grab my bike from against the wall on the enclosed porch on the screen door and jump down the concrete steps. I'd hop on my bike and speed down the drive. It was very dark outside, but there were bright lights in the front and the rear of the house that created big pools in the yard. That's all the light that I would have. I executed my maneuver just as I planned, but my elbow slipped off the button on the handle and banged into the door as it opened, and within seconds, I was pumped down the gravel drive. I turned my head to the left, filling my ears with the roar of air I was cutting through and stopped pedaling. My eyes fixed on the rear of the house. I was 100% sure someone was coming. I don't know how or why. It was only a moment, but I didn't look away despite my own skepticism. At the last instant I saw him, a man wearing dark clothes and a ski mask came tearing out of the lit yard around the back of the house and plunged into the deep shadow along the side heading for the front, where I had been only seconds ago. I was invisible, wearing black from head to toe, and instead of running straight for me, he went to the porch where the commotion that I had just made came from. I turned forward and leaned into the pedals. I could barely see the driveway, but I had ridden my bike down it so many times at night, and I could make out the large stone post of the dirt road. I almost wrecked turning the corner, but recovered and speeded away. About a mile further, I finally stopped at the intersection to a paved road. My heart was pounding in my chest and my forehead was sweaty. I stood there for a bit and got my breathing under control while I tried to digest what had just happened. My thoughts were racing. I knew darn well what I saw, but I was out of danger. All I could do was press on. My neighbors were Amish, no phone, I wouldn't have known what to say anyways. When I got to my friend's house much later, I told him what happened, and I called my mom. She listened and didn't give me a hard time, but I could tell that she didn't know what to think. She wouldn't be home till morning, and said she'd be careful. And that was it. I had heard laughter once from the edge of the woods, and things in the yard had been moving on occasion, but no one else had these experiences and I assumed it was backwards Amish kids fooling around. Nothing had ever happened before, 
I doubt Amish kids would know how to disconnect a phone line though. I'll start off by saying that this story is not necessarily crazy, shocking, or super interesting, but I still feel very confused. I met this guy back in 2012 on Omegle. He's from South America and I'm from Europe. We chatted and he was really funny and interesting to talk to. Super smart and we really just hit it off. We stayed in contact over the years and I considered him to be a trustworthy person and a good friend. We talked about private stuff all the time. He was always single though and had a really hard time finding women that are interested in him. He also had been battling depression. He would get very drunk sometimes and text me about how he felt so lonely and how he tried to commit suicide twice. About two years ago he offered a scholarship in a country close by and we ended up meeting there. I'm married so my husband and I went together and we hung out and he was cool and all. Once his high school was done he was planning on traveling through Europe so we offered for him to stay at our place for a weekend so we could show him around. He agreed to that and it all seemed normal. A few weeks before he was supposed to come he suddenly told me Oh, by the way, I'll stay seven days. That's not a problem, is it? And I was like, eh, it kind of is. That already threw me off a bit, but I thought, well, it might have been a misunderstanding be better. I was also pregnant at the time and just didn't want to have somebody over for that long. I just need my space. But then he said, hmm, that doesn't work for me. Can we do five days? No idea why, but I agreed to it. So my husband and I took off work so we could travel around with him, but he basically was a completely different person suddenly. As soon as he came over, he acted all weird, absent, didn't say thank you for anything, basically was just lounging on the couch not wanting to do a single thing. He took two showers a day, each around 45 minutes, and I found that to be pretty strange. And just overall, he barely said a word or showed us any interest or anything. I asked him several times if something was wrong, but he assured me he was fine. He also handled my cats pretty rough when they were in the room that he was sleeping in and wanted them out, which is a no-no. I felt incredibly uncomfortable in my own home and was more than relieved when he left. He had some weird energy around him. After that I was really disappointed and kinda didn't want to be friends anymore because I was so freaked out by him for some reason. So we ended up not talking for a while. He was basically telling me the same stuff as always. He was feeling lonely. After six weeks, I noticed that he has not been texting me at all anymore. And I was going to check up on him. Texted him on Facebook, just to realize his profile was deactivated. So first thought was, he committed suicide. So I texted his best friend. He then told me that the guy tried to kill himself a few weeks ago. But that didn't work, so one night he entered his roommate's room, tried to rape her. She jumped out of the window and broke both of her legs. He then turned himself into the police, and he's now in jail. Out of all the things that happened, this was the last thing anyone who knew him ever thought he would do. He was always very informed about feminism and supported women's rights. I was totally shocked and had some feelings that I can hardly describe. I don't really ever want to talk to him again, but I also feel sorry for him. Maybe I should have seen the signs, because looking back he clearly was having more issues that he opened up about. But then again, he committed a crime that's inexcusable. I also feel really creeped out, because he slept over at my house and my husband and I both got creeped out by him, but we thought we were just being dramatic and didn't trust our gut. Next time though. I am definitely going to trust my gut feeling. This happened about four years ago. Some backstory first. I'm from Australia and lived there during this event. At the time, my girlfriend, now my wife, lived in another country but was visiting me over Christmas break. I lived in a big city which if you drove about an hour in any direction would either lead you to another city or beautiful nature. 
My friends and I decided to take my girlfriend at the time to see some of this beautiful nature and decide on a national park about an hour and a half from where we lived. This place is definitely no sort of secret location. It's very well known, but there are a ton of different areas to it, all with different rural and windy roads taking you to various areas of the park. We'd gone in two different cars, my friends in one, me and my girlfriend in another, to have some time together. We finished out the day of hiking and we're heading home down one of the less common roads. I remember seeing this really beat up old 70s sedan with a wild looking dude in the driver's seat drive past us in the other direction. This wasn't uncommon as there are a lot of smaller, less economical sound towns spattered around the area. But for some reason, him and his car stood out and my girlfriend noticed as well. About 200 meters further down the very windy road, there was a pull-off area. Just a semicircle of gravel that you could pull over to look at the views towards the ocean. There was a camper van belonging to a company that mostly rented out colorful vans to backpackers, parked there with a woman standing in front of it. As soon as she sees us, she jumps out onto the road and flags us down. Now I've heard enough of creepy experiences in my life to know pulling in to help her on a quiet road may not be the safest idea. But back then, I hadn't really heard too many stories about that. And my friends were in the car directly behind us. Luckily, she wasn't the person I didn't want to meet. She was quite obviously upset and scared when we pulled in. I told my girlfriend to wait in the car and I got out to speak to her. She was almost in tears. I can't remember where she was from, but it was Central Europe, touring around with her four or five year old daughter. She told me her van had broken down and she pulled off there and called the van company's assistance line and was waiting for help. By this time my friends had pulled in behind us and a couple of them had come over to see what was going on. Apparently a scary man had driven past her a few times already. First time pulling over to offer her first time pulling over to offer to take her and her daughter to the nearest town for help. She had thanked him and said no thank you, and that she was waiting for the assistance vehicle. He left, but then kept driving past every 10 to 15 minutes in opposite directions, slowing down and looking at them, then driving off. She begged us to stay with her for a while while she waited for the assistance vehicles, because this guy terrified her and her kid. I agreed. But my friends, being the awesome people that they are, decided that me and my girlfriend were enough people, and they ditched us. Thanks, guys. We stayed with the woman for a little while before the car my girlfriend and I saw driving earlier drove past slowly, coming the opposite way that we'd seen him the first time. As soon as he had driven around the bend, the lady told us that that was the scary man that she had been seeing before we got here. This got my girlfriend and I to take her much more seriously after the feeling that we got from the guy just seeing him down the road. A few minutes later he came back from the other direction and pulled into the parking area. Some more context. I am not an intimidating guy. I'm tallish, but I have almost zero muscle and fairly soft features. So there's not at all anything intimidating about me. There's just me. A non-intimidating guy, a terrified foreign woman, her tiny daughter, my girlfriend, who doesn't look intimidating but is tough as nails, parked off of a quiet road in a rural location with a not-so-nice looking guy pulling into where we were. Great. He gets out and he's a total redneck and definitely not friendly looking. No judgment on the redneck part. I come from a poorer country town north of the city and those are my people but hopefully that sets a picture. He strolls over to us. At this point, I walk towards him to put myself between the girls and him. I have no idea where this bravery came from. I would definitely not describe myself as a brave person normally. He looks at the girls and then me and then asks if he can help. I tell him no, we're just waiting for the assistance vehicles and tell him that we've got it covered. He then says maybe he could stay and wait with the woman and the daughter so we didn't have to. I tell him that we're happy to stay and thank him, but again we've got it covered. 
He kind of just stands there, staring at all of us, not really saying anything, giving off creepy vibes. After what seemed like forever, another car drove past us, looking out but kept going. This seemed to startle the man. He mumbled good luck and then got into his car and drove away. We waited for this poor scared woman and her daughter for almost an hour and a half. Ended up talking a lot, and hopefully we had made her opinions off Australians a little brighter after the mega creep who drove past one more time 15 minutes later had left us. Finally the assistance vehicle arrived, a bigger dude who could definitely handle himself. I asked to see his ID to make sure that he was safe, but he was in a car marked by the company, had all of his tools and definitely seemed legit. We gave the lady my number and asked her to text me when she was off safe. She was so grateful for us for staying with her for such a long time. It made me feel good that even though this dude was just a weird looking awkward country guy that didn't mean harm and was really just trying to help, we had still made her feel more comfortable in a strange way. I don't think he was and definitely believed he was up to no good, but you never know. I did get a message from her saying she was safe, so everything ended well and we never heard anything again about that creepy guy. We kept driving by. So this happened a little over two years ago now, and I wanted to post it somewhere just to look back on it one day and never forget the lesson that I learned. Just a disclaimer, yes, this is real. I wish it wasn't. It was 2016 and I had just started a new job at a motel. It was low pay, but I needed an office job. One of my friends, Michael, got me this job. For a few days, I did training with the owner in the mornings. For two nights, Michael trained me. Our job was the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. Nothing exciting. Checking guests in and doing paperwork. My boss, who was the owner, went away with his wife on vacation for a week which is attributed to the swift training I had to endure. So it was my first night alone on the night shift. There was a monitor with security cameras around the motel's property and large glass windows all around the office building with a glass door. There was no night window like most motels have. It was fairly early in the night at about 1 a.m. I was just doing my normal check-in paperwork when a man walks in and asks if we have any rooms available. Usually if someone is sketchy, my boss has me lie and say no, but he seemed normal at the moment. Without hesitation, I said, yes, of course, just for one, and he replied, yes. So I began creating the reservation on the computer when I notice he starts swatting the air and making spitting noises as if he's being surrounded by flies. I tried to ignore it, as far as I was concerned it wasn't my business, so I try to check him in into the room as quickly as possible. I give him his key and he is on his way. At this point in time I could be described as very timid, I had a lot going on in my personal life, so I hope you can all understand my reaction to what happens next. The man comes back from his room and slams his hand on the glass door and causes me to jump. Absolutely frightened, I look up to see him just staring at me. He cracks the door and puts his head through, and he says, I can't get into my room. Why won't you let me into my room? My only defense is trying to be helpful, so I replied with, Maybe there's something wrong with your key, let me give you another one. The look he had in his eyes was inexplicable. I felt like I was in absolute danger. I handed him his new key and he went back to his room. I tried texting Michael because he is the one who trained me. Though it was the middle of the night and he was asleep, I needed some guidance. With no reply from Michael, I noticed the man trudging down the stairs to come back. I go into absolute panic mode. I run into the back office and lock the door and I pull out my pocket knife. It's important to keep protection when working at night. I hear the man in the office yelling, Hello? Hello? Why won't you let me into my room? Do you not like me? 
Me being an absolute idiot and not standing my ground and calling the police when I'm feeling scared. I decided to take the situation on, alone. I reply, I'm just on the phone, I'll be right out. I then start calling Michael over and over for help, but no answer. I decided to take a few deep breaths and then step out of the office. The man was not there, he was in the bathroom. I start hearing him talking to himself, angrily saying, Kill her, kill her. My heart sank. Still being an idiot and not calling the cops, he comes out and I say, Your key was broken, I'm sorry, let me escort you to your room. He agrees, thankfully. I was wearing a long sleeve sweater, so with my arms down I was able to hide my knife in my hand while I was holding it. I began to walk outside and he seemed hesitant to walk behind me. We began making our way to the staircase and up towards his room. I was sweating from how nervous I was, continuously looking behind me to make sure he wasn't going to make a move. He stops at a room and I stop at his room a few doors down. I smile and say, Oh, that's the wrong room. This is your room, as it clearly said on the door. The whole time he was going to someone else's room and trying to open the door, I felt bad for them. I quickly ran back to the office and locked the door. The next guest I checked in was a police officer from a few towns away. I felt bad for confiding in them about the guy, but they seemed willing to keep an eye and an ear out. The next night the man came back, but I had the doors locked and told him that we were all booked up. I explained to my boss what happened when he got back from vacation, however he didn't really take me seriously. I continued to work there on the night shift for the next year, where many other strange encounters happened. The lesson to be learned here is, if you ever feel uncomfortable, always call the police. This took place two summers ago in the hometown of the Cowboys. Now I am aware of human trafficking in this city. I had a co-worker pulled out of work and put into a safe house by the FBI because she finally decided to rat on her family. However, I never thought they randomly snatched people. In all the stories, they use drugs. So two summers ago, I am cycling to a smoke shop. It's kind of out of my way in a not great neighborhood but I'm fairly confident. It's daylight. I ride all over the city and I know the store. I was 24, short, and had short pink hair, but I always considered myself too intimidating to kidnap. I forget that even if I am a veteran, I'm also a short white girl. I pull up to a crosswalk and I'm waiting for a light when two Hispanic guys start catcalling me from a windowless white van. No identification, no stickers. Even the way they yelled at me was weird. It wasn't the typical, nice tits, or any other locker room talk. They would talk to each other and then yell through a cracked window about how we are going to get you and you are next. It felt off, like they were excited, but I just flipped them both off and rode away. End of the story, right? Over a mile later, I'm right around the block from my destination. To set it up, there was a massive empty lot, really more like two lots on my right. That was the side I was riding down. To my left, there was a back fence of a very, very old and probably abandoned house. It was like that all around, mostly drifters or old people in poverty, a few trap houses. The point is, there was no one else visible and even if they had seen this, they wouldn't have said anything for their own safety. I'm pedaling along when the album ends, and I think I'm almost there, and I'm not going to stop and fumble with my phone. This saved my life. As I'm thinking this, a white van pulls up on my left and stays right inside my peripheral. They revved the engine a few times and tried to spook me, but something told me not to move. Don't let them know you know. So I acted like my music was playing and pedaled a little faster. Up ahead of me was a brick wall to my left and a tall tree over it before a quick alley entrance. Suddenly they punched the gas 
and pull up right in front of me, stopping next to the brick wall. They were trying to corner or funnel me, putting me in a position where I had to ride between their door and the wall. This all happened in a span of maybe seven seconds. I honestly didn't feel panic. I didn't actively register any fear or sweat or anything. It was like someone much calmer took over my body. I remember instantly crossing the street without even thinking about the movements or why I was doing them. As I pedaled up the other side, I realized this was the van from before, and now it had a window repair magnet on the side. It's too small to look good, and absolutely no contact info, just a generic name. I kept rubbernecking and see that there was no one in the front, but there was movement behind the seats. The guys were in the back by the door. They had planned to literally drag me off my bike, off the street, and do God knows what to me. Once I was passed, they scrambled into the front seat and pulled out so hard they burned rubber. I got to the store safe, but I still hated myself for not taking the plate number. Not that it would do any good, they'd probably switch them out later. I know I had almost been kidnapped and killed or worse, but it wasn't until I told the story to someone from Mexico that I found out it was traffickers. They said it sounded sadly familiar and happens all the time. I have no family and my roommates are just roommates. I would have been gone for three to seven days before anyone decided something was wrong. Even then they would have just known I left on my bike and vanished. I would have been across the border or dead before anybody knew I was gone. I will first give a little backstory to my living situation. I was about 10, possibly 11, when my mom found a job, working as a live-in manager to a quaint little motel at the end of my town. She took the job, we packed up and left my childhood home. When we first moved in, it was a disaster. Holes everywhere, certain parts of the house smelled horrible. We later learned this was because the old manager, Steve, was a druggie and his wife was making and dealing meth out of there. A couple months into living there, we had sort of fixed the place up and made it livable. At this point, my mom was working full time at the desk. We had mostly stayed towards the back of the house because of the odd setup. The way the front desk where you check in is laid out basically in our living room. It was a tiny, cramped room with just the desk on one side and a door on the other, which led to our living room a lot, and I mean a lot, of people decided to just open that door whenever they pleased, and often got a view of whatever video game my brother and I were playing. This, as a kid, already freaked me out because of the motel's past. Many meth heads came by looking for Steve, and would walk right in when they didn't believe my mom, when she said they didn't work or live here anymore. One time, during summer break, a year or two after we moved in, I decided to stay up all night and play video games. I made a little nest in the living room and made myself comfy. It was around 1 in the morning, after playing hours of Skyrim, when I started to hear weird noises. Usually if my mom knew a regular would be late, she would leave a key in an envelope for them, which looking back doesn't seem smart at all. I heard talking. It sounded like two men speaking a different language. I figured that's what they were doing and would leave in a second, but they never did. The talking continued for 10 minutes before I started to hear them pull on the door. First, it was gentle, as if they were testing it. As they continued, it seemed to get more frantic, and I could almost hear grunting. Soon, it was full-on banging on the door. I was confident my parents would hear it, but their room was all the way in the back of the house, which was about three hallways down. So after a minute, I figured I was screwed and probably going to die. I was a super paranoid kid. The banging stopped, and after a few seconds, I started to hear tapping at the window behind the desk in the house. I saw clearly a head from behind the curtain. The windows were high up, and he looked to be stretching up to get it. He started to yank on the window, trying to break it open. While he was doing this, I saw movement at the screen door in the kitchen. 
At this point, I was in absolute terror. I was petrified. I'm guessing the guy who was at the desk door had now circled around to the screen door while his buddy was prying at the window. He jiggled the doorknob back and forth. After a second resuming what he was doing earlier and now banging on that door full force. For some reason, through my fear, I decided to try and be a ninja, to up my sneak level of course, and army crawled into the little office part connected to the desk. There was a key drop off where people could just shove their keys into when they checked out. That was basically just a hole in the wall. I popped up, all while they were still banging on the door, and I grabbed a pencil to lift up the flap. I don't know what I expected to see. They were clearly at the side of the house but I just had a horrible feeling, like I was being surrounded. Turns out I was right. When I lifted it, I saw two more men standing at the door, hands in their pockets. I immediately closed it and almost cried. During this, I failed to notice the hallway light turn on, and my parents emerged, looking very distraught. As soon as my dad turned on the kitchen light and shouted, What's going on? All the noise stopped and the guys took off running. I could hear one of them shout something and then nothing, just complete silence. After I told my parents what had happened, the best I could get through hysterics, they called the police. The police showed up about an hour later and took the report. It didn't seem like this happened to anyone else in town, but they seemed to think that it was some Mexican workers who came up from the hops farm and maybe didn't understand we were closed. I don't know. It seems like they were just kind of race blaming but I never really got an explanation of that night. All I know was that they didn't seem friendly, and I don't know what they would have done if they got in. Let's start this off with some background on me. At the time, I was already a hardened recon trooper. This was my first long-term tour of combat. I had not even a month prior seen one of my best friends killed right in front of me while two others were permanently maimed in a horrible ambush in the city. It was a nightmare watching my friend die from massive bleeding, us not being able to do much except give him morphine to keep him from the pain. That was terrible and I'll never forget that, but not even that spooked me to the core as much as this did. After that ambush, we were moved out of the city to a forward operating base. It's like a small city walled in with concrete T-wall barriers and HESCO barriers. Think big 4x4 boxes filled with earth and stacked 16 feet tall to create a huge wall, about 1 meter times 1 meter stacked 4 meters high. This particular FOB was interesting in that some of its barriers to prevent easy entry were simply huge mounds of dirt with guard towers planted on top of them to ensure people and vehicles didn't just run in at random. Being a recon force, we were tasked with constantly going outside the wire to do patrols and be the land and airspace quick readiness force if something happened and someone needed fast and skilled firepower or extraction. For this duty, we were assigned helicopters and light armored Humvees and we lived next to the improvised airfield on the outskirts of the FOB. Our housing consisted of tents covered in an insulated foam to provide a more permanent structure with air conditioning units to keep us cool as we slept and worked, maintaining our gear and whatever else. We lived four guys to a tent as each of us had a ton of gear we had to keep mission ready for a variety of missions. There were 20 of us, in total separated into two squads and teams, and we shared this little tent village inside the wall together. In this instance, we had just gotten back from a late night air assault mission. Everyone had gone to bed after having finished cleaning our gear and eating. In the middle of our tent village was the latrine trailer, a house trailer fitted with showers, sinks, and toilets so we could keep ourselves clean. I woke up around 4 a.m. and needed to use the restroom, so I grabbed my headlamp, my rifle, and one magazine, and headed out the tent to the bathroom. As I was walking to the trailer, something just felt off. Maybe it was a slight change in air pressure. It didn't fully register in my mind 
as I just had to go. So I quickened my pace to the trailer, went inside and did my business. I pulled my shorts back, washed my hands and walked outside, staring at the ground to make sure I didn't fall down the stairs, on the trailer or stumble on some rocks. As I rounded the corner, I lifted my head and saw a pair of green, glowing eyes set in the darkest fur I had ever seen, 12 inches from my face. I'm not a tall guy, I'm around 5'7", and maybe it was just the adrenaline kicking in, but I swear this thing was looking me eye to eye. I figured I must be seeing things because I'm so tired, so I turned my head, and when I looked back there was nothing there, but a wisp of dust in the air. I stood there for a second trying to collect myself, and then I looked back at the ground and saw paw prints that were at least four inches wide. If I hadn't just relieved myself seconds earlier, I probably would have at that point. I was shaking and sweating like I had just been in a firefight. I locked and loaded my rifle and peeked around the corner to make sure it wasn't still there, and I made my way to the radio tent to tell the two guys that were still awake what just happened and then I carefully made my way back to the tent and went to sleep. The next day, one of the first bullet points on the daily briefing was about some huge panther that had escaped a local sheik's compound and was eating local shepherd's sheep at night, and how we should be on the lookout and never leave your tent without a battle buddy, as the guys all chuckled. There were signs posted at the chow hall and in the tiny shop on the FOB too. We never did see that thing again, and I don't know whatever happened to it, but I know that whenever I walk outside my tent late at night after that, I was always locked and loaded. So about 10 years ago, I was in college and decided at the urging of some of my friends to do an open invite D&D session at my apartment. It was really close to the college itself, but not on campus, and it wasn't part of the dorms in any way. It was above a restaurant, so it was pretty clear that my apartment had nothing to do with the student housing. This is important for later. So the night comes and the stage is set. All in all, everyone seems nice and things are going well enough, except for one guy. There always has to be that one guy, so I try to let it slide. He's being really pushy and going on and on about his character's background and this and that when we have not even got to him yet and are just trying to set up the story and play the game. Then, because he has some grudge against another guy there, he starts passing me notes and trying to get me to randomly help him kill this guy's character for no reason. First of all, that would have made no sense in the setting of the game. Secondly, that would accomplish literally nothing for those who don't play D&D. It's not like if your character dies in a random one-off game, you have to just trash it and never bring it out again. Thirdly, this guy was just all up in my personal space, whispering in my ear and passing me notes and telling me how to play, like he was in control of the game, or me in any way. It was really uncomfortable and weird. I didn't want to make a scene, since I didn't know how everyone who showed up knew one another and decided to just ignore him and try to have a good time, despite the fact that he would not get out of my personal space. When it became clear that I was not going to listen to him and help him kill that other guy's character, he had a meltdown. He literally stood up and started throwing D&D books at my head, all of them that he could reach, and screeching that I should have done what he told me to do. And this was my punishment, and next time I had better listen. I opened the door and told him to get out, he told me I couldn't kick him out, because somebody else had invited him. I told him that I didn't care who invited him, this was my apartment, that I paid rent for, and I had every right to kick him out, and he was lucky I wasn't calling the cops. The rest of the table backed me up and pretty much ended up having to shove him out of the door and down the stairs to get him to leave. The dude could not grasp the fact that no means no, and his actions had consequences. I'm 100% sure that no one ever made him have to follow through with any sort of punishment before by the baffled look on his face as I closed and locked the door behind him and went back upstairs. So I get back upstairs and people start apologizing to me and telling me he is like that all the time and they didn't actually invite him. 
He just shows up wherever they go, and they can't get him to leave them alone. And every time they try, he throws a tantrum. We get back to the game, and things are going pretty well for about 20 minutes, until I hear my doorbell ring. So I go downstairs, and it's the tantrum guy with some other guy that I've never met before. The tantrum guy is standing behind this new guy with his chest puffed out, and this whole look about him, like, you're in trouble now. So I open the door and ask if they are here to apologize for the tantrum guy assaulting me earlier. And the new guy immediately turns around to look at the tantrum guy, and it's clear he did not get the whole story. I tell the new guy what actually happened, and he tells me that he is an RA with the school, and I have to let the guy back into my apartment if I'm holding a school function. I tell the RA guy that first of all, I rent this apartment, and it is not part of student housing as should be apparent from the fact that it is, again, above a restaurant. Secondly, even if he was an RA, which I have no proof of, as he could just be one of the tantrum guy's friends, that doesn't give him the authority over any building I'm living in, because he is not my RA. But that doesn't matter, because again, I don't live in student housing. I live in an apartment above a restaurant. Finally, that this is not a school event, it is a private gathering which he would know if he was a real RA, and not some guy that the tantrum guy snagged to come back here to try and do I don't even know what at this point. This RA guy keeps insisting that I have to let him into my apartment, and that if I am a student, then wherever I live is student housing, and that he needs to come in to inspect the place. It becomes more and more clear that this is just some random guy that they wanted to be in my apartment for nefarious purposes, thinking that I am here alone for some reason. I tell them that they are not getting in, and if they continue to stand there and try to get me to let them in, or if they try my door after I leave, I'm going to call the cops, and I proceed to shut the door and head back upstairs. Everyone at the party was asking who that was, and when I tell them, they all decide it's time to head home. I tell them that they really don't have to, but they tell me it's getting late and this whole thing is starting to weird them out, and echolate in weird ways that I can't really blame them for. When I go downstairs and open the door for the tantrum guy, when I go downstairs and open the door for them, tantrum guy and the RA guy are across the street and seem amazed for some reason that these people were still in my apartment and were now leaving. I never had any more trouble with them, but I also never had another D&D night. It just didn't seem worth it. I still play, but just with groups that I know, and I never saw those two guys again. This happened to me and my friend Sam three winters ago. We liked exploring nature and walking around outside and our friends had recently introduced us to this beautiful place in Wisconsin, Grant Park, for anyone familiar with southeastern Wisconsin parks that we had visited with them three or four times. Every time we had gone with them it had been a pleasant trip. We walked around, got to see some beautiful views of Lake Michigan, sat in crooks of trees, and talked about books and games and other things. We had started a new game of Hunter, The Darkness, a tabletop RPG game like Dungeons and Dragons, and we were using the park for scenic inspiration. It was great. For the purpose of storytelling, and she and I are both five foot two and five foot three females. The first time she and I went alone, we went around dusk to take some pictures that we could photoshop for the game. This park is massive, and there are many bridges, footpaths, and winding roads throughout. We were walking over a bridge that sat against one of the roads, with dense woods on either side. As we were crossing, a car drives by and rolls down the window, and some guy leans out and yells, Hey! at us. We both were startled and jumped, 
but dismissed them and continued walking across the bridge. And less than a minute later, the same car comes back driving in the other direction. And this time, the driver's side window is rolled down, and the driver, another male, calls out, Hey ladies, come here! We pick up our pace, and the car drives away. And right as we're about to hit the end of the bridge, we see the car come at us again from the original direction. We then book it into the trees, up the hill, and we hear the car stop, and the two men start yelling for us. We continued running, and hid in the dark for 15 or so minutes until they left. Then we ran back into our car, and fled. You would think we would avoid the park after that, but once we'd gotten out of there and probably warmed up over a hot chocolate from Perkins, we had a good laugh over being so scared. We went back to the park with our male friends a few times, and nothing even remotely scary had happened. So she and I had decided to return with just the two of us. Sam and I often spent our afternoons and early evenings exploring the outside hiking, geocaching, and just sitting outside in parks talking. So we had decided to add it to our repertoire. We headed back around dusk again, and with our camera to take more pictures, especially since we hadn't gotten the shots we wanted first time round. Now, obviously, looking back on this we both feel incredibly foolish having returned, alone, and around the same time as the first time. But as I had said, we had gone a few more times with our male friends, and even when we had just one male friend, nothing had happened. So we thought we were being skittish, and that what happened before was just a one-off. So we returned, and we were about to walk over the same bridge, when a car rolls by, and you guessed it, the windows roll down and it's the same guys. They make some random noise. This time, we don't wait for them to drive around. We duck into the woods and start walking back towards the pier. We figured we'd abandon the other photo spot and just explore the pier and take some lake shots. Not really what we were looking for, but we figured if we made it in time for the sunset, which was almost all the way down, we could take some nice pictures over the lake just for fun. The way that the pier is set up, there is a long thin road from the top of a giant grass hill down, and around a curve and into the parking lot. The pier is at the end of the right side of the parking lot, about 200 yards away. If you walk from the pier down to the right side of the parking lot, there's a little bridge that led into a development with a tennis court that sat next to the preserve. So we began walking down the road to the lake, when the same car from before drives down into the parking lot by the pier. They didn't say anything as they drove past, but we still decided to slow down, and decided whether or not we wanted to continue down by the pier. The car turned around in the parking lot, and came back up the road. The car reached where we all were and stopped, so we immediately turned and started walking down the hill. All of the windows rolled down, and we saw that there were four guys and one girl in the car. They yelled hello, and Sam and I turned and waved. One of them then said, Oh hey, you're so cute. And the others joined in, Hey, yeah, wait for us. Now mind you, we are two small females, but we are also super bundled up in large winter coats and hats. You could barely see any of our faces or our shapes, so they didn't really have a lot to go on. We've been ignoring them, and hear someone yell, We're coming back for you, as they start driving up the hill. Sam and I decide not to take any chances, and start running down the hill. We hear hooting and hollering and see them disappear over the tops of the hill. We start running towards the bridge as it was closest, and once you've gotten over the bridge to the left, 
there was a concrete deck with a drop off to a ramp about five feet tall so that if you got off the bridge and jumped down right away you'd be at the bottom of the ramp and couldn't be seen from the other side if you ducked down which is exactly what we did we hear the car speed back down the hill and four doors open and close as they all start screaming and laughing come here girls we'll be nice we just want to play most of them took off to the pier but two of them stayed behind and we could make our bits and pieces of what they were saying where do you think they went I don't know, but we'll find them. Sam and I are huddled and freaked out, and once it has been silent near the bridge for a while, we decide to peek out to see if the other two have also left, so that we could sneak back up the hill, or make a break for somewhere else. We peek over, and there's a guy on the other end of the bridge, and he clearly sees us. Over there! He screams to his buddies and starts running across the bridge to us. We take off towards the development, running around the sides of the tennis courts while being chased by three of the guys. Only one of them is very close, about 30 feet away, but the rest were catching up quickly. We took a quick turn between two houses and the subdivision, and we were luckily never seen from them by that point on. We jumped into our cars, by walking through the forest preserve incredibly slowly, dashing across roads and terrified out of our minds. We left that night and call our friends who we normally came with, and from then on, they insisted on accompanying us every time we went out there. Since I am at home now, because of my fibro disability, I've got a lot of time to tell my tale. Back in 2007, I started a tech job with an IP slash phone slash VoIP slash DT1 slash long distance company. The company is no longer around, and honestly, I don't know how they stayed in business as long as they did. It was really a pyramid scam, but thankfully, I was on the IT side of things, so I didn't have to sell anything. It was a small, typical tech support call center. The customers would call in or Verizon slash Quest etc. would call and say DT1 lines were down or outages. I was the only female on my team, having to prove myself and show that I could do just the same as my male counterparts could. It didn't take long and the customers respected me for being able to handle things. After making my mark, I decided to take the 10 hour night shifts. I worked Wednesday to Saturday from 1 p.m. to 12 a.m. and an hour lunch after 6 p.m. I was completely alone in the whole building. The rush to get out of the office by 6 p.m. was insane and I couldn't blame them but I decided that having three days off was better than two. Like I said, I was by myself for most of the night. I would have to keep an eye on emails and make sure that I answered calls. It was a very slow shift. I would get a lot of time to play video games, read, do schoolwork, or just write. But sometimes, I would just wander the building, or call around just to get away from my desk for a while. I would have the VoIP phone system connected to my cell phone, so I wouldn't miss any calls. This allowed me to get soda, go get food and so on. One time, whilst I was up away from my desk, I was going down to the lunchroom to grab a soda. The vending machine was on the basement floor, and the basement had a wall of windows and one set of security doors, same for the main entrance. Only. There was one camera facing that door. Nothing else to make you feel very safe. I didn't like going to the basement much, because the back of the building faced an acre of dark woods. There was a walking path to the woods, but for some reason, 
they didn't install lights for the walking path. Never really sure why that was, but it really didn't help the creep factor. Sometimes I would see animals run past, but other times I would feel like someone was watching me. I always tried my best to make it fast when getting a soda or snack, but sometimes I didn't feel fast enough. So one night, I was making my way down to the basement of the building to get a soda. It was a slow, dragging night, and I needed a little caffeine for a pickup. I counted my money as I walked to make sure I had enough to get in and out quickly. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw something dart from the glass door back into the darkness. I stopped dead in my tracks and tried to scan the forest. But like I said, it was just blackness. I felt a bit of unease, and everything told me to turn on my heels and go back to my desk. It was 9 p.m., and I had a fair bit of time left on my shift before I could blow this popsicle stand. I tried shaking the feeling off and briskly walked over to the soda machine to make my selection. The soda dropped down and as I bent down to get it, I heard a loud ping noise. It was as if someone had hit the glass with something. I stood straight up and felt the hair on the back of my neck stand. I slowly turned around and was scared to see someone out there. But as I made the full turn, I saw once again nothing but darkness. I thought this was a good time to book it back up to the main floor. I didn't bother with the elevator. I went up the stairs and ran up them. My heart was already racing for having to go down there in the first place and then the loud bang and now running up two flights of steps. Once I was back at my desk, I sunk down into my chair and tried to calm down. It was just one noise. I was in a building with locked doors and locked inner offices. I kept saying over and over in my head that it was nothing. I was relieved by that, but out of nowhere, I got the feeling that someone was watching me again. I peeked up over my cubicle wall and looked around my office. Nothing seemed out of place until I turned face to face with the front of the building. Outside the first set of doors was a slender, tall, dirty male. He was cupping his hands around his eyes to try and see past the reflections of the light inside. I dropped back down in my cubicle before he caught sight of me. He didn't look like anyone had ever seen at the office and it was a little past 9pm. There is no good reason he would be checking out my office. As I sit in my chair, I hear the door shake. I slowly stood up and watched him pull at the handles of the doors. And to my relief, they didn't budge. But as I watched him, he turned to face me. His face looked bruised or dirty. I couldn't tell which. Once his eyes were locked with mine, he started to bang harder and smacked the glass. I was so scared. It was the middle of the night. I was by myself and out in the middle of nowhere in this office building complex. I grabbed my headset and dialed 911. While the operator was getting on the line, the guy was walking back and forth from one side of the glass to the next. 911, what's your emergency? The lady's voice was direct. I'm working over at 42 on Malavesta, and I need someone to come out now. There's a guy trying to break into my office building. While speaking with her, the guy disappeared from view. I tried to look in all directions, but I couldn't see him. I knew that he wouldn't just walk off, not with how hard he was banging. And out of nowhere, a good-sized rock came out of nowhere and smashed against the door. I screamed and went underneath my desk. The operator asked what happened, and I explained that a rock smashed against the glass door. 
She asked me if the glass was broken enough to let him in. I didn't want to stand up and look, but she told me to look in order to know where he was. I crawled out from under my desk and peeked over the wall and saw a huge crack down the first part of the door. I sank back down and told her to please have the police hurry. She said they were on their way. I have heard so many of these stories, and when they say that the cops couldn't get there fast enough, they aren't kidding. It feels like time is standing still, and you can do nothing. There was another smash against the door, but along with the sound of glass breaking, sirens could be heard coming towards my building. It was music to my ears. I told the operator that the police had arrived, and thanked her for all her support. I stood back up, and looked over the cubicle wall, and the red and blue lights were flashing wildly. But the thing I didn't see was the man. The top part of the door was completely smashed, and the rock was laying on the inside of the entryway. One officer came to the front door, and others were out combing the area. I could see their flashlights moving around the parking lot. The first officer to come into the building and greet me was very kind. He had patience with me and let me explain what I saw. Soon, my boss arrived and checked on me and the damage. At some point, my husband was called and I was told I would be escorted home by one of the officers. I took the next few days off and started to look for another job where I wouldn't be alone at night by myself. When I gave my statement, I explained to the officer that the person could be partnered with an ex-co-worker who was fired a few weeks prior for stealing and just not showing up. He knew when people came and went. He knew where they kept the cell phones that we were selling, not under lock and key, but under desk of the provisioner. From smartphones to Blackberries, when they were still worth buying, of course. I went to leave this job about a month later and started at a credit card machine company. It was an office full of people, still a call centre, but I felt safer, especially with security guard and cameras all over the building. Like I said before, the company is no longer around. It was bought up by another company and they basically liquidated all the funds that were worth something. This story takes place in August of 2013, in the mountains of South Oregon. I am a USAF Security Forces Airman, in other words, a military policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick and I decided to go exploring some back roads and get out of the heat in town. South Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days searching on roads that we knew, finding roads that we did not and driving for hours into the mountains. Eventually, navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road that we'd never been on before and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for about an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of any other people in the woods. We rounded a bend into the thick fir woods and emerged into a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noises, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, Right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. 
Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the Aspen Grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees, as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5 foot 5, but regardless the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck and I noticed that he was looking back into the aspens. At first I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of colour that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet away from this strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread hit me and felt certain that there was someone in that tent and if we could see the tent they could undoubtedly see us there were no campgrounds in the area no people no main roads for miles surely someone camping so remote would be well at the very least a strange person however as we observed the tent we didn't see any movement nor hear any strange sounds coming from it. Nick suggested that I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? There was no reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area. But we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in that tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it just the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the campsite, should there be any need to leave in a hurry. He would be waiting at the wheel, my heart pounding. I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up, with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, and no wood collected. The tent, oh the tent, it was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave to tell Nick what I had seen. As soon as I left, I heard Nick begin to yell, Let's go, let's get out of here! Not knowing what he was yelling about, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat-up old Ford Tauros on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men and the third person was laying against the window of the back seat. As we drove across the meadow the driver attempted to block us from the road but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way that we'd come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still don't know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police and they promised to send a trooper out to check the scene. I received a call the next day from the trooper, stating that the campsite and the backpacks and all the women's clothing was gone. Though he could tell that people had been in the area, the strange table was still by the thick aspen grove, and I have not returned to the area, and do not have any intention of doing so again.
So, as a kid I lived about a hundred miles away from the nearest town, at a house without electricity or running water, which is the works in the Colorado Rockies. This place was in the absolute middle of nowhere, and we frequently sought all kinds of wild animals, ranging from elk, deer, coyotes and cats. Our property and a bunch of other neighbours' properties bordered National Forest roads, so to keep people off our road, we had to get about a mile and a half from our house that we drove through before we reached our house. This time of year, we are the only people up there, as all the other homes are hunting cabins, long empty by this time in late winter. Now, this was not the type of gate that you could drive around if you forgot your key, there were tons of trees all around it, with barbed wire, ditches and such, so anyone wanting for off-road around it would basically have to build a new road around this gate. Well, one night, my mother, brother and sister and I pull up to the gate, and we cannot find the key. It's gone. So one of us, i.e. me, has to walk all the way back up to the house in the pitch black to fetch the spare key and make their way back down. Now, it's recently snowed in January and it is totally dark. You can't even see your hands in front of you dark. And with the new snow, you can't hear anything either. There are a few clouds in the sky on and off to let some starlight through every once in a while. But it's dark. And of course, there isn't a flashlight either. So off I go. First, you walk through around 200 metres of trees. Then it opens up to a huge meadow, which then narrows back down again to trees for another 200 metres, and then opens up again into another huge meadow, which on the other side of is our house. I set out and everything seems fine. I'm just irritated that I have to do this. I'm about 15 years old at the time and a little angsty teen that is peeved off at the slightest chore. I was not thinking about my surroundings in the slightest. But as I'm walking, I get that feeling that I'm being watched as I'm halfway through the first meadow. That deep, creepy dread that something is right behind you and you can't see what it is made it a thousand times worse by the lack of light and lack of being able to hear. My first instinct was to run, but I knew that if there was something, I was just going to provoke it. So I kept going, and then stopped to try and listen, as I heard a crunch echoing my footsteps. Holy shit. This time I walked a little faster, and I knew there was something behind me. It was probably a cat as well. So I just kept walking right into the second bunch of trees before it opened up into a meadow. I could see our house. I could feel the pressure. At this point we were predator and prey, and I could feel the breath on my shoes. So second clearing comes up and I know what the plan is, and I am about to book it. Thankfully, I'm familiar with what to do, and I scream as loud as I can. As I do so, my dogs hear me, and they run to chase whatever it is from behind me. They continue running past me, and I book it into the house. When I get in, I grab the 12 gauge first and the key second, then pick up the tractor keys and jump in. There was no way I was going to walk that again. As I'm driving back towards the gate, I see the dogs running back. At least they weren't hurt. That could have been extremely dangerous. I also see the tracks. I knew it was a cat. It actually started approaching me from the first meadow and was tailing me for a long time. I tell my family the whole story and I know that I'm not going to get any sleep tonight. From that day, I refuse to be out alone at night in the countryside without a weapon.